public instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> I'm delighted to have Sarah McCammon today on the Enemies List. You have heard of Sarah and you know Sarah's work and voice from uh, National Public Radio, where she is the national political correspondent and the co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast. Uh, Sarah understands what's going on in American politics at a level that most people couldn't imagine. She covers it from the ground up uh, and understands really um, what the shaping forces, what the driving forces are underneath a lot of the political conversations. And one of those big driving forces is the evangelical movement in America. She has a tremendous book called The Ex-Vangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. Um, and Sarah, welcome to the Enemies List today. I'm so happy we're finally able to get this, this show recorded. Um, and I wanted to start out by asking you, um, you've this is a journey you understood personally and that you've seen directly. Tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write this book and, and, and what your sort of biggest takeaway is on it. And then I want to drill down into the details. Sure. And thank you so much for having me. I, I enjoy, I've interviewed you before. I enjoy listening to your show. So this is, this is fun Thanks for so me. much. Um, you know, I grew up evangelical in the Midwest in the 80s and 90s. Um, at the time, I thought we were sort of like a small oppressed movement of sort of true Christians. That was what sort of what was presented to right. me. Um, I had no idea how politically influential this movement I was growing up in was. And I, I sort of, to one degree or another, and we can get into that if you want to, for various reasons, moved away from it in my adult years. I went to an evangelical college, married a Southern Baptist pastor's kid in my early 20s, kind of followed the playbook, and then had wrestled with a lot of different aspects of evangelicalism. Not rejecting Christianity, not rejecting God, just struggled with aspects of the culture and some of the beliefs uh, that I'd been presented with. And kind of privately had my own journey out of that. Um, I'm in my 40s now, so this was 20 years ago. Uh, I professionally, as a journalist, found journalism to be a refreshing and exciting place to work because there were no preconceived answers I was supposed to arrive at. In fact, I was encouraged by my training to seek out multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. which was something I hadn't always been encouraged to do. So I, I spent a lot of time away from the evangelical world. And then long story short, Rick, I found myself right in the thick of it in the 2016 campaign. I was assigned to cover the Republican primary and suddenly Donald Trump and the white evangelical movement were the story. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't look away from it. I, I saw a lot of things that I recognized from my childhood and I, and I wound up covering it as a journalist, of course, but also fascinated because of my own personal connections. And, and so, um, from that experience and then from some of the conversations I started to see playing out in public spaces online, mm -hmm. mostly social media spaces, among other people who'd grown up like I did at that moment, talking about what it all meant, that was what this book, um, that was sort of where this book came right. from. Um, so you, you, you write about sort of the, the, the contradictions that you started to feel and see more clearly and, and some of the contradictions that, that, were always present, but you weren't as conscious of. And I'm not an evangelical, so I have a sort of externalized perspective on it. But to me, as somebody who always was around them in the Republican process, there was always a sort of like two worlds of the evangelical movement. There was the vast majority of people who were honest, God-fearing, good people who lived in a culture and a community that wasn't really hate-driven, that wasn't really... Um, that wasn't really the the sort of politicized other half or or other other part of that movement. It's it seems to me, at least as an outsider from this, that at this point we now have an evangelical white Christian movement in the country that that the rank and file have become very engaged in the politicized part of what used to be 
a tiny faction of the leadership or a tiny faction of, of, of folks who really believe that they weren't getting solutions uh, in the culture. And it seems like that has inverted right. completely. Right. And, and I think um, based on my own observation and, and talking to a lot of people who, who uh, think about this, um, I, I, I think what's happened is that I think it's important to understand that there was always a political project associated with yes. evangelicalism, at least all of my yes. life. So, I was born two weeks after Ronald Reagan the, was inaugurated. The, 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 so there that has is always been new. politics in that, yes. Always for my entire life. Um, but I think it has become intertwined with and infused with the theological, spiritual, and religious project in a way it wasn't always. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, I think that 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 infusion has spread sort of to the masses, to the rank and file. Now, when I was growing up, most evangelical I knew would have been conservative. They would have voted Republican, not all, but mm -hmm. most. Um, but I think that there is a, a consciousness of politics and, and, and a, a, an increasing um, appetite for extremism in some segments of the evangelical world, uh, far more than there once was. Uh, so it's, it's new, but it's not new. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the roots have been there for a long time. Um, but I think evangelical has increasingly become a political label, at least as much as a, a theological or spiritual one. Mm -hmm. And that part feels new. And, and, the, and the political project that, that evangelicals have embraced, it seems to me, has in a really meaningful way been defined by the, the rejection of moder modernity, the rejection of contemporary culture, the rejection of of in a in a in a big way two central things uh lgbt matters and abortion and and i right the abortion argument is easier for me to understand than the than the lgbt side in some ways because there's always been a cross flow of of gay evangelicals they've always been out there they've always been part of the church part of the culture part of the community not maybe publicly but so those two areas I have a theory of the case. I want to run this by you. When gay marriage burst onto the American sort of cultural scene, it was one of the fastest cultural transitions we've ever had in this country. I mean, it, it, it went much smoother and, and much more deep into the society than, than almost any other cultural change we've had in a very long time. I know a lot of evangelicals had a sense of shock and sort of horror about it. They were like, oh, my God, how, how, how has this been forced down our throats? Why is this being forced on us? Was that like the catalyzing moment that led a lot of these people into the political wing of the evangelical movement? I don't know. I think if, if anything, I think for a lot of younger evangelicals, it was the opposite. Hmm. And, and maybe that maybe that is sort of a, a moment of. Uh, of crossover, a threshold moment for people, how they responded mm -hmm. to that. Because there's a lot of data, and there has been for a number of years, that suggests that younger evangelicals are much more comfortable with uh, LGBTQ rights, much more friendly to gay marriage um, than yeah. their than their predecessors. And, and, I, and, and not that young. I'm talking my mm -hmm. generation, millennial and below. Um, and so I think maybe it was a shock to some of the, you know, the powers that be, the older leadership, to see that that quick cultural acceptance. Um, and, and I, I think for, you know, I mean, I remember as a young person wrestling with this, being told, um, taught, you know, evangelical moral beliefs about homosexuality. One of the central figures in my book is my, mm -hmm. my grandfather, who, um, I don't think it spoils too much to say came out mm -hmm. late in life. And that was a, that was a, an important part of the story and an important part of the tension mm -hmm. I felt was sort of watching my family, my fundamentalist evangelical family respond to him. Um, but I remember wrestling with this and thinking, well, why is it that we have these beliefs about, you know, marriages between a man and a woman, but why, why is it necessary then to make that the law of the land? And I think that for, um, you know, for an older generation of evangelicals, it was just, this is what's right and wrong. This should right. be the law for, for younger evangelicals. It's, you know, especially in a, in a world where you have gay friends or a lot of, a lot of evangelical young people grow up and realize they are gay. You know, it, it shapes the way that you look at it. I mean, I think fundamentally it helps us see the humanity of, of gay people. Sure. It shouldn't be hard to see, but if you're, if you're, if you're cloistered in an environment where you're told that this is against God's design, it's, you know, um, it, it creates a barrier. And so, you know, for me, it was, it was knowing my grandfather and mm -hmm. loving him that sort of 
opened my mind to thinking about that differently. Um, and we live now in a, in a world where, you know, communication is fast, where there is wide cultural acceptance of gay people as there should be. And, and I think that that has, it's certainly just shaped the way that younger generations look at this. Within the I, I came out in favor of gay marriage, if that's the correct way to, to use that term of art, um, back in the early 2000s, because uh, I am a pretty decent reader of the cultural river. And I, I, I'd been public about it since back then, but in 2012 or 13, I guess, I wrote something in Politico about it. And Rush Limbaugh lost his damn mind on me for like a, 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 an hour one day, just put me on the flamethrower. And I cannot tell you what that does when you're still a Republican consultant to your world. It sort of like melts it down a bit. But the most fascinating part of it was I heard from so many of my very evangelical friends who were like, thank you for saying that. You know, you know, my cousin, my friend, my brother, my my uncle, whatever. And. And in my case, it was my two sisters. God bless, right? Yeah. And, and I didn't approach it from a religious perspective. It was a libertarian perspective. Like, what government? What what business of the governments is this? It's not. But sure. But what was? Yeah. Can I ask? What this might be a tangent? But what was Limbaugh's argument? I mean, Limbaugh was not a. He was a fascinating figure because he was, in some ways, kind of a precursor Absolutely. to Donald Trump, right? Not 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 an observant man himself, but somebody that evangelicals resonated with. I think they resonated with uh, sort of fighting back against the culture, yeah. right? So what was his argument? That the Washington even remember? liberal elite consultant class, and while I may have been in the elite consultant class, I haven't lived in D.C. since 1993, but okay, um, uh, was trying to break the spirits of the Republican base and the evangelical movement. We were trying to we were trying to force our our liberal Washington beliefs down their throats. That was essentially the argument. And and, and you know, it's it's interesting you say that he was a sort of precursor to Trump because for all that Rush Limbaugh preached the conservative gospel, he the guy was I mean uh, real real talk, the guy was kind of a degenerate. I mean honest answer. He was not a he was not this sort of upstanding moral figure in his in his private and personal life and everything else, and, and which brings me back. And he didn't really pretend yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, you know. No, I know. Which which is kind of refreshing in a weird way, um, but which brings us to to Donald Trump, and something my Democrat and and liberal friends cannot understand is the embrace of Trump is so intense and so passionate and so desperate at a certain level I, explain to us what in the character of the of the sort of modern evangelical white christian movement allows that contradiction that the multiply divorced serially adulterous lying um cheating uh, uh, cruel disrespectful inhumane all those things that are the antithesis of the stated value set how Explain to our guests or, or to our listeners how that works in their heads, how that how they how they justify that kind of of a of a departure. Well, it operates on a couple of levels. I mean, the simplest is instrumental and pragmatic. Trump will get me what mm -hmm. I want. I heard, you know, some version of that many times sure. covering the 2016 campaign. It's a binary choice between Clinton and Trump. Trump aligns with my policies. Clinton does it. Of course, we see we saw in this um, 2024 primary that when given lots of other choices that aligned with their policies, Republicans still chose Trump and white evangelicals have chosen Trump in overwhelming yeah. numbers once again. So it operates on that level for sure, but not only on that level. And uh, I think the best explanation from my research, from my reporting, from talking to people is this idea that Trump is a, a fighter. He is a fighter f against the culture that we see as in decay, mm -hmm. as decadent. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying we uh, in the voice of evangelicals, right, of course, personally, of course. but um, that evangelicals see as as in decline, as rejecting God. They they certainly many of them see um, the white acceptance of, of uh, LGBTQ people as part of that. Uh, they see declining um, influence of Christianity and the larger culture as part of that. And, and let's be honest, our culture does face a lot of problems, right? I mean, I mean, we are not a perfect not country, the but they're they're making uh, they're making a connection between these things in their minds, and they've and they've been led to by their leaders. I mean, this is this is the messaging I heard from a young, you know, from a very young age, which was from people like David Barton, who is a 
discredited historian uh, and many others. We were founded as a Christian nation. If we keep following along with Christ and, and, and maintain that identity, we will be strong and successful. Mm -hmm. If we don't, we will fall apart. Of course, ignoring many of the failures of that quote unquote Christian nation, you know, slavery right. and the treatment of indigenous people at the top of the list. Um, those things were not, were not highlighted in that conversation. But I think that's the mindset that a lot of evangelicals come from. They are afraid of the cultural change they see around them on, on multiple levels. And they see Trump as fighting back against it and against the, uh, the elites. That, that battle with the elites, that battle with the culture, uh, it, you know, it, it, it has locked them in with a guy who may or may not destroy their movement in the end of the day, I think. There's, a, there's an argument to be made that, that, and you certainly look at it in the book, that there is a cultural schism happening inside of the evangelical movement right now. I think, I think essentially based on generations. Um, and, and, and I'm watching that movement interest uh, with, with interest because it's now about to breach two barriers that, that I think are going to cause a big disruption inside the, inside the evangelical movement. The first is the IVF fight, which is, you know, a corollary fight to the, overall abortion battle, which they won. Right. They won the battle. They won. They killed Roe v. Wade. And and yet, I think the thing that shocks me is not that, that it happened, because they told us it was going to happen for 50 years. They had a plan from the Federal Society, and the movement had a plan for 50 years almost to legally overturn Roe v. Wade, and they did it. Um, but there seems like, True. I mean, there is no, there is no contentedness about that because immediately what you see in the States, it was 15 week ban, six week ban, total ban, criminalization, and now it's hit IVF. I'm curious where you think that the, the overall battle is going on that in the minds of both the, 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 the evangelical white Christian Nats, nationalists, sorry, um, and and how that affects them more broadly in the political space. I know, I can tell you it's had a big disruption in the Republican female vote. We're seeing it in our polling. We're seeing it in the data in enormous numbers. But I wanted to get your take on that. It's, this IVF thing is a problem for the, um, the anti-abortion movement, especially the most mm -hmm. stringent elements of it. Because on the one hand, you know, most Republicans and many independents will describe themselves as pro-life. But what that really means, if you drill down, it means different things to different people. And so the, mo the more ideological people believe they have, you know, they're, and some of this is tied to, frankly, Catholic moral theology, which evangelical um, theology has subsumed to some degree because of the political alliances between Catholics and evangelicals. Um, but without getting right. too in the weeds on that, I mean, the, the more ideological uh opponents of abortion believe that li literally that life begins at conception so that an embryo has personhood, it has moral significance on the same level as a, as a human being. And if you truly believe mm -hmm. that, that does have implications for all sure. sorts of things. Um, you know, not only for abortion at the earliest stages and for any reason, but also for some forms of contraception mm -hmm. and in vitro mm -hmm. fertilization, which could compromise the success of an embryo that's been created. Um, but this is something that I think the rank and file who call themselves pro-life don't fully understand. And, you know, it just, in terms of marketing, it's, it's, I think for a lot of people in the pews, the idea of being pro-life, being opposed to abortion, letting babies live, that's very appealing. But the idea that you would shut down access to something like IVF that creates babies, well, that doesn't sell very well. And I mean, we see this in polling from people like Kelly, mm -hmm. Kellyanne Conway and former advisor to President Trump overwhelming numbers of white evangelicals support access to IVF. Do they all understand the details of how it works or what it means? And have they, you know, have they sat in a theology class and talked about uh, the moral underpinnings of these questions? Probably not. I mean, who has the time? But it is, it is a, a sort of an intellectual problem for the movement. And it's becoming a political problem, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, people see the real world implications of these laws and policies. And there is a segment of the anti-abortion movement that would like to go much further and much further than even most Republican oh, sure. voters oh, oh, would oh, like yes. them to go. Right. And, 
I, I do think I do think that that I mean the the desperate backpedaling from Kelly and even from Donald Trump, who is not a bright man, but he's a cunning sort of guy when he reads a disaster coming toward him, you know, tried tr- walked it back as quickly as he could. But there there does seem to be this sort of Overton window in the policy side of the movement that gets to X and says, "Well, X is okay, even though we we told we told you X was the end goal, but." You know, we got a little bit of X plus one or two or five or seven or whatever. Um, you know, you talked a lot about this, and I want to get back on this this topic a little bit. Sort of the uh, there's an emergent, um, an emergent part of that evangelical movement that leaving the movement doesn't mean leaving your faith. Leaving the movement doesn't mean. I'm an atheist now, and I enjoy gay abortions and Sharia law, whatever, whatever the crazy sort of Fox version of it is, or the or the crazy like edge case version of it is. Um, talk to us a little bit about that journey for people, and 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 are they finding a community that's broader than just sort of uh you know the, then then oh great you're not you're not you're not you know in the in the edge case anymore. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, the answer is different for everyone. I I talk to a lot of people um, who have left evangelicalism for various reasons. Some of them do end up atheists or or agnostics, but others end up in other religious communities. You know, some, uh, one one of my friends is an ordained minister. Uh, Another, um, several people I talk to are part of churches that are um, you know, sort of more theologically and, and politically progressive, more open to questions. Uh, as part of my reporting for the, the ex-evangelicals, I, I went to a church in Nashville that um, someone described to me as sort of an ex-evangelical church. And it, it was interesting because um, the pastor grew up, I believe, Southern Baptist. Most, a lot of people who go to this church um, have an evangelical background. So not everyone. There are, you know, lots of queer people. It was multiracial. But the whole idea was to sort of explore spirituality with kind of an evangelical flavor. I mean, there were, you know, songs up on the overhead projector and people raising their hands and a worship band, just like you'd see in the churches I grew up in. Um, But there wasn't an insistence that you have to believe a certain Mm -hmm. thing. Uh, And so, and, you know, you can find that other places. You can find that in a Unitarian church. You could find that in a lot of, to some one degree or another in a progressive mainline Protestant church. But, uh, but I think for, for these folks, they wanted to sort of hold on to something that was familiar and that was how they were doing it. And, and so I think the answers are, there are as many answers as there are people. Um, you know, for my part, I've spent time in mainline Protestant churches. I talk about in the book, I'm, I'm married to a reformed mm-hmm. Jew. So we go to synagogue sometimes. We, some, we also go to church on, <laughs> on Christian holidays. And so, you know, I think the thing you lose is, you know, there is something really nice and comforting and almost like swaddling about having a community around you that knows what it believes and asserts it, you know, dogmatically, um, th- there's a comfort sure. in that structure and it's a little scary to take that away. But for me, I couldn't stay inside of it and be connected to people I loved, like my grandfather in the way that I wanted it needed to be. And really in the way that felt loving and right and even Christian to me. Yeah. I think that, I think that, that, I think that's one of the things that that I noted in the book that made it sort of heartfelt was that there is a there is a there is a pain in leaving a community. There is a there is a sort of discomfort and transition that you don't know that you're you're stepping into the you don't know that you're ever going to be able to to replicate that sense of of presence and people and comfort in your life where the there's a shared set of 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 values even even if you're feeling like those values aren't yours anymore there's still the sense of like you, you you miss it. You miss that. You miss that 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 world. Um, and there can be rejection that comes with that from people oh, that you you know mm-hmm. love. And and I think this is one of the things that I hope the book will communicate, especially for people outside the evangelical world. You know, a lot of people who have no my a lot of my liberal mm-hmm. friends who have no familiarity with this world will ask me like, why do evangelicals believe this? Why do they do this? Why do people stay in this? And you know, my book in a way is an answer to this question. Like it's it's really hard to leave it's really painful Mm -hmm. to leave and there's a huge personal cost and it's also giving up a whole subculture it's not just a set of ideas it's a culture it 
and and I, I know you're born from the, in the Midwest, but a lot of Southern evangelicals, it is even more of a cultural daily part of who they are as people, who their families are, how they interact with their families, their neighbors, their community uh, that is that is mediated through that entire experience and 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 that entire sort of space. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the what I call business Christianity these days, because it has become in the evangelical movement an enormous enterprise. It has become in many places mm -hmm. in the mega church part of the evangelical movement. And, and I, I have a, a, a really close friend and a longtime colleague who is, well, I would call him a struggling evangelical. He, he, mm -hmm. he really is a deeply good hearted man, but he is some, some aesthetic part of him is like, I do not want to go to a church where there are people on wires swinging across you know, the, the, the stage, I don't want to go. I'm not Smoke going machines. to church to worship my Lord and savior. If there, if I'm not going to pick a, a church based on whether there's a 32 piece orchestra or a 60 piece orchestra, you know, or, or, you know, are there flame pots and sparks when the, when the, when the pastor walks out that part of the church, it is very easy for outsiders to mock. What is it about that part of the church? Is it just the, that they want to sort of equally flashy cultural uh you know artifact driven with the same hollywood technology or what what is that i've i've never understood it i think it's you know there was a term that was big in the 90s when i was a teenager which was seeker sensitive mm -hmm. churches which like being sensitive to people who are seeking something okay. spiritually and i think that's part of it i think some of it's just straight up marketing sure. um you know it is a desire to to be flashy and appealing <laughs> <clears throat> of course, there's, I mean, religion in general, including evangelicalism can be extremely lucrative. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been, you know, that's been, uh, that's been a prob uh, sort of compromising factor for a long time. I will say my parents, and I say this in the book, were, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I will say my parents, and I say this in the book, were, were very skeptical of the televangelist movement, you know, in the 80s, who were asking people for money and, you know, dressing very flashy, that didn't seem authentic mm -hmm. to them. And I, and I have to agree. For me, when I was in my, you know, early 20s and struggling with my faith, I found all of that marketing to be a little, um, it felt manipulative. I felt like I was being scammed. And it was partly because I was struggling with the fact that I had this gay secular grandfather who we believed was going to hell. Mm -hmm. And we were praying for him, you know, every day growing up. And then to walk into a church that felt like a little bit like, like some combination of a carnival and a movie theater and a corporate office um, product launch. <laughs> it just felt, it felt really off-putting. Like, like if this is really true and this is really important, um, it, it should, it, there should be a seriousness about it is how I felt. Now, obviously it appeals to some people. And I think, you know, I think for some people, a church like that is just fun and right. I don't begrudge them that, but um it's it, it's hard. It's hard. It was a hard juxtaposition for me with with what we were what was really being taught under the surface and the way that things sometimes were presented. Yeah, I've I've, I've always found that sort of fascinating and and uh, that 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 emergence of of the the entertainment enterprise around all these. The, you know, we've got our cable channel at this mega church and our streaming show and and somebody who did an analysis of a bunch of the political registration stuff on a bunch of mega churches for me one time uh, in, in swing states said, these people, they have a deeper reach than you think. There's a, he's describing an evangelical church in uh, North Carolina, and he said, a mega church. He says, they have 60 separate Facebook pages for that church with different things that they do. And they have hundreds and even thousands of members each. So there's a, a there's a, a it's built this gigantic uh, infrastructure to build that culture for those people in in a more modern vernacular than the than the you know the, than this the the, the 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 tent revival guy. Well, and it provides something that modern culture has largely destroyed, which is which is community, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we 
we just function so differently than we did, you know, 100%. even 50 or a hundred years ago. And you can walk into an evangelical church and be put in a small group and be put in a Sunday mm -hmm. school group and connected with other moms or whatever. Now, if you don't fit into certain categories, you might not fit in right. at all. But for those who do, it can be very comforting. So Sarah, what do you see the future of the evangelical movement looking like in the country right now? I love that question. I wish I knew the answer. I think what we can see for sure, if in, you know, there's a lot of data in this book and I, I try not to make any, any predictions, but what we see in the data right now is that um, white Christianity is on the decline, including white evangelicalism. Um, there's interesting stuff happening with uh, evangel in evangelical spaces of color. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, sort of black conservative churches are pretty steady. Um, there's a lot of, of course, be because of immigration, the Latino evangelical church is a vibrant space and, and potentially even a, in a growing sort of one. separate yes. faction. Yeah. And that's that. And there's overlap there. And, um, you know, the politics are different, though. Right. When you uh, inject another culture, another lived experience um, from the, the white evangelical experience, the politics get different or a little bit different and or a lot different. So um, that's something I'm, I'm curious about and sort of paying attention to. Um, you know, I was talking to Sam Perry, who's a sociologist at the University of mm -hmm. Oklahoma and is quoted in the book and is somebody who does a lot of work around evangelicalism that I really admire. And, you know, he was he was sort of positing. And I think that this may be true that evangelicalism is kind of becoming now where maybe Catholicism was 20 or 30 years ago in the sense that when I was growing up, you could be sort of a cultural Catholic or a cradle uh -huh. Catholic and go to church twice a year. And that was it. Whereas at in evangelical churches, there was a huge emphasis on like, that is not enough. That is not true salvation. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. You've got to be in mm -hmm. church every Sunday. You know, you, if you, if you're not, you've got to rededicate your life to Christ, all of this kind of messaging around really being plugged right. in. But I think that evangelicalism has become so pervasive in some form or another that there, there are a, a large number of people like myself who have ties to it, but aren't still, you know, sort of in the system in the way that we once were. And I, I do wonder how much it sort of becomes a, a cultural phenomenon mm -hmm. exclusively um, as it becomes more of a political phenomenon. But then the big question is, where do people go spiritually? Because I think people still have those, many people have the desire for something uh, I, bigger. I, and, and I don't I know think that's that pretty like. deeply wired into our, I mean, it, into our culture, our brain chemistry, our, our design spec as human beings to look for both both belief and and a community of belief um and and so i think that's why this is a, a really valuable book sarah i really i, I you sent it to me a couple of months ago i read it in, in a in a sitting basically on, a, on an afternoon and i really appreciate your time oh, today you. folks the book is the exvangelicals loving leaving loving living and leaving the white the evangelical church by sarah mccammon sarah thank you so very much for joining us today on the enemies list we'll look forward to talking to you again sometime soon Thanks so much, Rick. So I spent the weekend of the 8th, 9th, 10th um, on my ass, sick as a dog, traveling for a couple months now really hard, and uh, it caught up with me. It wasn't COVID because I'm vaccinated like a human. Um, but the target of my ire at the moment, the the target of my of my boundless seemingly infinite well of rage at the treason of these people is the Chubb group. Um, apparently, the Chubb group are the people who underwrote Donald Trump's bond um, for $100 million. Now, why, why am I mad at them? Why am I angry with them providing Donald Trump with $100 million? Because they're tied to the damn Russians. And You'll see more stories about this in the coming days, but the coverage over the weekend that I read um, is starting to draw the bright line back to the fact that Donald Trump is, is on the take. He's owned by these people. Of course they came through for him. Of course they did. And, and whether it was the minimum case of this guy at Chubb approving this and giving him this money, or the maximal case of of Vladimir Putin putting in a call to somebody who called somebody who said, hey, you're invested heavily in Russian oil and gas, Chubb. Maybe you should help out our boy. Um, whatever it is, uh, 
I can't imagine in a billion years that Donald Trump will get the rest that he needs to pay all of it because there he's the guy is clearly in the pocket of the people he publicly adores and that's the Russians and they're always on the damn enemies list.